Good morning, everybody. Welcome to our morning ASEA. Uh, uh, we used to call this our power call, but now it's our Zoom. So I just want to welcome everybody and say hello. We are interviewing today uh, Dr. Ralph. That's what he goes by. And I would just like to read a bio that he has for himself. Dr. Ralph E. Stevens received his PhD from the University of Tennessee in 1970. He then spent over 10 additional years in research and training in the fields of radiation biology, molecular biology, and cell biology at such institutions as the University of Toronto, Fells Research Institute, and the Weister Institute, the Mayo Clinic, and the Ohio State University, where he eventually joined the faculty in the departments of radiology and pathology. Dr. Stevens ran the Cell Culture Laboratory at OSU for over 20 years. He has investigated cell division and the processes regulating cell division for over 40 years and concentrated on his own cell research on the differences between human aging and cancer. I mean, this is, this is pretty incredible. Um, published numerous papers and book chapters before retiring in 2001 when he and his wife Irene became avid RVers. <laughs> that is a dream of my son. <laughs> he came out of retirement when he was introduced to the product ASEA, containing stabilized bioactive redox signaling molecules. Since this new science of redox biochemistry was an extension of what he had studied for over 40 years, he began to research why these molecules were so effective in human health and wellness, athletic performance, and, and anti-aging. Dr. Stevens now spends much of his time investigating this new science and telling others of his role in their lives. So I, what a great introduction for um, Dr. Stevens. Thank you, this took us a few weeks to be able to get you to be on here, but we're so excited that you're here with us today. Thank you. Thank you, Lori Ann, uh, and thank you for inviting me. Um, I'm glad you didn't tell them everything I've been doing or else they would uh, think I wasn't able to hold down a job. But there's a lot of things I want to tell you and share with you about my journey with redox signaling molecules uh, because they fall into two categories. It falls into a personal category and it falls into a professional category. Now I want to start out with uh, the professional category first. This began uh, 40 years ago, I guess, when a professor of mine took me to Beaufort, North Carolina, and uh, we studied uh, sea urchin eggs. We got eggs and sperm from sea urchins, you know, those spiny urchins. I know you said don't use my hands, but those spiny urchins that you don't want to step on in the ocean. <clears throat> and uh, mix a dilute solution of sperm with the eggs and uh, put them in a Petri dish under a microscope. And I looked at them. And as soon as the sperm touched that egg, the entire egg changed colors. Now, there's one thing I want you to remember when I keep telling you these stories. When I finish a story, say to yourself, signals. So the entire outside of that egg changed colors. And as I watched, a dimple formed in one side of the egg. Now, my wife tells me that spheres don't have sides, but I kind of ignore that. And then this dimple began to elongate, went all the way around the outside of the egg, and began to constrict like a purse string until there were two cells. So what I had just witnessed with my own eyes was one cell going into two cells. And I said, how did it do that? And that one question was responsible for the rest of my professional career. How did it do that? Now, you remember the word I wanted you to remember? 
I didn't know that word at that time. So I bummed around, uh, as Lorianne mentioned, to several places doing postdocs, picking up new text, techniques and learning new uh, ways to investigate cells. Ended up at Ohio State University, and I was still interested in cell division. How did one cell go into two cells? And I had a model system that I used. I had normal cells and cancer cells. Now, the cell culture service there at Ohio State used University, we only used human cells. So if I took a piece of tissue, disassociated into single cells and put it into a Petri dish about three and a half inches in diameter, and then looked under the microscope, the cells would attach to that dish. They would then divide and fill up the bottom of the dish, one cell deep. And we call that a confluent monolayer. Filled up the bottom of the dish, one cell deep, confluent monolayer. I could take the cells out of that dish and put them into 10 more dishes. And those cells would divide, uh, attach, divide, and fill up the bottom of those 10 dishes. So I would have 10 confluent monolayers. I could take one of those, split them into 10 more dishes, and I would have 10 more confluent monolayers. So I could do this two, three, four, five or more times, yeah. and then something happened. The cells quit dividing. They didn't die. They'd move around the bottom of the dish. They weren't dead, but they could not divide. They had lost something. Remember the word? Then I also used the cancer cells, put them into a dish, uh, and, and different types of cancers, it didn't matter what type of cancer I was studying, I put them in a dissociate and put them in a dish, and attached to the bottom of the dish. They would divide, they would fill up the bottom of the dish, but they wouldn't stop dividing. As a matter of fact, they would pile up on top of each other so deep that the cells on the bottom would starve and die. They had lost something. They had lost the ability to stop dividing. So what was responsible for that? So now I have normal cells that have stopped dividing and cancer cells that won't stop dividing. So I said somewhere between those two is the answer to how one cell goes into two. The answer of cell division that I've been looking for all of these years. Now, I could change the way the cells acted. For instance, normal cells would divide about 50 times before they became senescent, before they became old, before they wouldn't divide anymore. If I irradiated them with x-rays, and I built my own x-ray machine so I could sit it right there on the bench and zap the cells, because <clears throat> we knew that uh, the x-rays produced free radicals, these bad reactive oxygen species, which would damage the cells, <clears throat> but they wouldn't lie, these reactive oxygen species wouldn't last very long, so I needed that x-ray machine right there on my bench. I would irradiate these normal cells and then put them in a Petri dish and see how many lifetimes they went through. Instead of going through 50, they would go through 40. So I had actually changed the longevity of these cells by x-raying them, by treating them with reactive oxygen species. If I had irradiated them with a higher dose, instead of going through 50 divisions, they would stop maybe at 30 divisions. Now, there's something we could do with these cells. I could cryopreserve them. I could take these cells put them in liquid nitrogen, and I could do this, and they could stay in, in uh, liquid nitrogen. Studies have been done, so we figured it, it was probably indefinite, but I could leave them in there two, three, four, five years, take them back out, and put them in a Petri dish, and see what the longevity was. So if the longevity was 50 years, uh, 50 divisions, we get 50 divisions. If these cells had been irradiated, and they were only gonna go 40, they would continue to go 40. 
or 30, depending on how much they'd have been rated. In other words, the cells remembered how much damage they had had. Now that was interesting to me. So I figured it was DNA damage. Remember, I have a molecular biology background, so I said, it's DNA damage and the ability to repair the DNA. So I measured DNA repair. And sure enough, in the younger cells, the repair was really good. But as the cells got older, the ability to repair DNA decreased. And this showed up in the ones that I had irradiated, as well as the ones I had not irradiated. Now, I could x-ray those cancer cells, and I could get one of two results. One, I could kill the cells. Two, I could stop their dividing. But it didn't seem to change the DNA repair. Now, stop the cells from dividing and killing cancer cells. Both are very important as far as the human uh, results are concerned because if someone is harboring a cancer, you know, there's a couple of ways that you can kill them. If you can either kill the cells or you can stop them dividing, either way, they're not going to cause any more problems. But that wasn't the answer I was looking for. I wanted to know why one cell went into two cells. So I have a clue here now. It may be the DNA damage. So I said, let's look at humans and see what the effect is. So we did a longitudinal study with, from uh, young people to uh, old people. We started out with teenagers because at the time we all had teenagers and we knew we could get blood out of them. And old people, we even went into nursing homes and everything. Now the amount of blood we needed was just a drop. Okay. So we could just take a, pinprick and get a drop of blood and we can do the whole experiment on that and we found out that as people get older we, as people get older their ability to repair DNA damage decreases aha so in, in cell culture the cells getting older they can't repair as well and in humans, as people get older, they're not as able to repair as well. So I was really onto something here, right? And I had a friend who was running one of the departments there in, uh, at the Ohio State University, and his wife, who's a psychologist in another, um, outside the medical college in another department, they said, well, what does DNA repair change with stress? And I said, uh, sure it does, you know, because people under stress get sicker. So it probably changes. And he said, well, can you measure it? And I said, absolutely. But nobody will believe it. He said, what are you talking about? And I said, well, nobody's going to believe this. He said, well, just do it anyway. I said, I have no problem doing it anyway. So we did it. Now, the stressor we used was medical students taking their boards. Mm -hmm. Now, it worked in medical, uh, medical school, so it wasn't hard to get medical students to volunteer, right? So we compared, we did psychological testing for uh, kids getting ready to take their boards and those who were not taking their boards. And sure enough, the ability to, de to repair DNA decreased with stress. And statistically, it was very significant. In other words, mental stress has an effect on your ability to repair DNA. So I, I knew I really had it by this time, right? Um, but, oh, and, and as I said, he had trouble uh, publishing these this results, by the way. He was on many national, international committees and he still had trouble publishing this result. They tried different journals and everything, and finally got it uh, published in some obscure journal. But his wife went to a, a psychiatry, psycho international psychiatry, psychology meeting in Philadelphia and did a platform session on this results. It was picked up by uh, you, uh, <laughs> AP, what, what is it, AP, those big national 
news people, and it went all over the world. So the whole world had seen this results. And not only that, she got the Young Investigator of the Year Award. So I don't, uh, at this international committee, so convention, so I don't know what was wrong with all those journals. They didn't think it was good science. But that international committee really, really liked the results. But it gave me another thing, okay? Physical stress, as well as mental stress, can decrease your ability to DNA repair. So I had lots of publications, and then I retired. Now, my wife and I RV'd around the country, all over the country, several times. And once a year, we'd go to Jamaica, fly down to Jamaica. And uh, on one of our uh, trips, we're going to fly out of Nashville, I dropped by uh, Pepper Black's house. Now, Pepper Black was my financial advisor and has been for years and years and years. So I went by to sign some papers. And as I was walking out the door, she said, Ralph, you got to try this stuff. I go like, pardon me? You really, really got to try this stuff. Well, what is it? Well, uh, it'll help you. Okay. Can it hurt me? No, absolutely cannot hurt you. Well, since she was my financial advisor and I had trusted her for many, many years, I just kind of threw up my hands and said, okay, here's my credit card. So I had to spend the night that day because her plane left out the next day. So the next day I was getting ready to get on the plane and here was Pepper Black with two bottles of Asia. Take these with you and start taking it because your order hasn't come in yet. I go like to myself, I think, boy, she really believes in this stuff. I said, thank you. By the way, she didn't give them to me. She loaned them to me. Okay. So I was invested, right? I took it as uh, my wife and I, Irene and I, took it as uh, it said on the bottle, two ounces in the morning, two ounces in the evening or afternoon. Because I was invested in it, right? I put money into this thing, so I'm certainly going to do it. But you know, just between you and me, I didn't believe it. See, I got a degree in skepticism. Not only that, I had 10 years postdoc after that, so I have advanced training in skepticism. So you think I believed anything she said? Mm -hmm. Well, a couple of months later, I was playing ping pong at the senior center in Crossville, Tennessee. And a friend of mine, former Navy flight surgeon, said I was playing with more energy and quickness than he had ever seen. And I kind of stepped back. And I was standing at the table. I just played five games in a row, and I wasn't tired. I wasn't breathing hard. I wasn't tired. And normally, I'd take a rest after each game. You see, we really knew how to play ping pong at the senior center. One of my opponents, for instance, was ranked seventh in the U.S., and several of the others uh, medaled at the Olympic Senior Olympic Games in Tennessee. So we really knew how to play ping pong. So when he said that, I kind of stepped back and I kind of said, uh, you know, something is something is different. And then he kind of slapped me virtually across the face with the, uh, are you on something comment? And I go like, whoa, what? Well, yeah, uh, multivitamins, um, fish oil, and a sea. He said, what's a sea? I said, I don't know, but I'm going to find out. So when I went home, I put down my bowl of popcorn, my remote control, got out of my lazy chair, went to the computer, and I started doing research. What was this a sea? And then I found out that I had been studying these reactive oxygen species for almost 40 years, but that was only half of the story. The redox, reductance and oxidants. And I also found out that these oxidants, which I knew and everybody else in science knew were bad guys, these oxidants, these things that cause oxidative stress, these things that cause everything from cancer to all our cardiovascular problems, immune problems, diabetes, you pick it, 95% of our chronic illnesses, 
these bad guys were not bad guys. These actually were the good guys. Nothing good happens in the cell unless these reactive oxygen species, these oxidants, signal for it to happen. So they were not the bad guys. They were the good guys. But when it goes wrong, is if you don't have enough of these good guys, or you don't have a balance between the reductance and the oxidants, the reductance and redox, they get out of balance, or you don't have enough, these reactive oxygen species start causing the oxidative stress. And they get out of balance when you're under stress. Remember the medical students? Remember x-ray in the uh, normal cells? Or if you don't have enough of them. And we found out now that you make about 10% less per decade of these reductants and oxidants, these redox signaling molecules, about 10% less per decade. And I'm 76, I'll be 77 next week. Happy birthday to me. So I've been through a few of those iterations, right? I have less of the redox signaling molecules than I did when I was much younger and I could fall out of trees, run around all day, trip over rocks, sleep like a log all night and get up and do it the next day. Can't do that anymore. I don't have enough of these signaling molecules. So personally, other than my ping pong game, these very, 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 very bad headaches that I've had for since before I was in high school, that I was taking 12 to 15 aspirin a day to fight off so I could work. And I had a super prescription pain pill that I carried around in my wallet all of the time was gone. I didn't have the headaches anymore. Now, yes, I'd messed up my digestive system with all of those aspirin, so I was on another funny colored pill for that. I'm not on that pill anymore. And I got up at my age, of course, five or six times a night, and that doesn't count when I got up for the day. Now it's not unusual for me to only have to get up once or twice a night. So my quality of life has gone up. And the reason quite simply is because I have more of these molecules. I'm not 10 years old, but my health, I am off all prescription medications. So these redox signaling molecules that are made in the mitochondria of every nucleated cell at every multi- Organ, uh, multicellular organism, of which I am one, is a lot healthier, mm -hmm. these molecules. You only get them one or two places. You can make them in the mitochondria of your cells, or you can get them in a bottle. Now, you got to do a couple of things. you got to have proper nutrition. If you don't, that's a stressor. And in this uh, day of processed foods, that's very difficult. So you need to have good nutrition. You also need to move. Now you don't have to do physical exercise very hard every an hour every day, but this body was made to move. If it doesn't move, the mitochondria that you do have are not gonna be making the ATP and if they're not making the ATP, this is another uh, seminar by the way and you're not making enough of those redox signaling molecules, so your cells can't possibly be as healthy as if you don't move. So it's probably a good thing I put down my bowl of popcorn and remote control and got up. So these signaling molecules, I had researched for many, many years, and Pepper was right. You gotta take this stuff. And I've answer, answered the question to all of those experiments, experiments I did for all of those years, all of those publications, why? Now I know why. And thank you, Lorianne, for giving me an opportunity to share this with everyone. Thank you, Dr. Ralph. Wow, that is one of the deepest explanations that I've ever had 
but totally went all the way around the whole cell and I loved it. I loved it. Um, so hopefully that gives everybody some background information that you have had your biology test, I mean your biology uh, lesson for the day. <laughs> um, that, that was like, that was intense and I get it because I was in radiology. I was a radiology tech for years. So all that you were saying, it was just all these things coming back, coming back, coming back to me. So thank you for all of that. And then tying it back in to really how Pepper introduced it to you. She didn't try and give you a science lecture. That would have been, that would have been terrible if she would have been trying to, she just handed it and said, you need this, take this. By the way, at the time, she didn't know I had a PhD. <laughs> <laughs> That's a she, good thing she, she did. Thought, I told her I was a teacher. She thought I was a high school teacher or grammar oh. school teacher. <laughs> <laughs> that, that came out later. Wow. Wow. So that just, you know, it shows you how it's so important to just share with everybody we know. Everybody. Because we have no idea what their body's going through, what they need. Um, and, and we do have to make a disclaimer. ASEA doesn't make any claims to cure, prevent, heal, treat, diagnose, anything. It just allows your body, your cells, to do what they were designed to do, just like you so perfectly shared with us. So we appreciate you taking the time to be with us today. Thank you so much My for pleasure. sharing all of your knowledge, for being here, and really taking the time. Um, do you still use that RV and, and go with your wife? Uh, no, we've, uh, we've retired from traveling now, and uh, we, we have other things that we enjoy. Oh, that's... But that's I highly crazy. recommend it, by the way. You <laughs> meet such wonderful people all over the nation. Wow. Well, wow, that's so great. Well, thank you for taking the time to be here. Thanks everybody for being here with us. And just a big shout out to Dr. Ralph. If we could all just clap our hands, that would, that would just be so awesome. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Thanks, Dr. Ralph. I can, I can hear welcome, everybody baby. saying that they can comment. That was awesome. Uh, thank you for being here. Okay, right. everybody, so um, have a great day. Thank you so much for all of your knowledge and expertise. Bye-bye. Bye. Bye, everybody. Bye. Bye, everybody. Bye-bye.